Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here, for Steve being here as well. We're glad you're here. Um, it's about time you are a little late. Can we get you anything? Maybe like a watch? <laughs> Aren't you happy we can do this? <laughs> this man over here, he's got the biggest smile on his face. So very glad that's happening. And thank you once again for being here, whether you are in our um, Family Center at this time, uh, meeting with us there or in the uh, library or in the kitchen. It's good seeing everyone back. They're waving back in the kitchen. Hello, you guys. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you're joining us at home, thank you for doing that. If you will look in front of you, if you're a visitor and if you have not filled out one of the guest cards, please. It's a green, um, blue. blue. <laughs> I'm colorblind, apparently. You ought to see me at a stoplight. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be on the board or up on this thing, whatever it's called. But it doesn't matter. I uh, just also want to direct you to look at your bulletin. If you didn't get a chance to pick up a bulletin, they're right outside the door when you come in. And just a few things. I see Goofy Glasses Night at the Iwana. Uh, it looks kind of nice. I always get a little bit offended uh, whenever they have the ugly um, sweater contest or whatever it is. And they ask me if they can borrow one of my sweaters. So... I don't know whether they're going to ask me to borrow some of my goofy glasses or not, but uh, please take some time to look through that today. This morning, uh, as we um, start our time of worship, gathering together, um, I want to read a psalm uh, which reminds us of what the Lord knows us completely and is always with us. He saw us even before we were born, which reminds us today of the sanctity of life. This is Sanctity of Life Sunday. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. He is always there to lead us to an everlasting life. Psalms 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. O oh Lord, hem me in behind and before, for you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is wonderful for me too lofty for me to attain. You created my inmost beings. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me and my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. Oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Search me, oh God, and know my Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm not nearly the dynamic speaker that Brandon is. <laughs> but I would like to, to pick on Steve some. So, also in the psalm, 145, we read, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let's all stand and we will start that praising now.
In Psalm 119, it tells us, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness.
together. And our Heavenly Father, we confess that we do need you. We want to praise you, Lord, for who you are. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in all of this election season, we need not forget that. Lord, you are the sovereign over every country, over every elected leader or appointed leader. And Lord, we want to make you the sovereign of our individual lives. Lord, we praise you because you are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. You're the one who makes things happen. It's not human will, human strength. It's you. So, Lord, we just praise you for your nature, for your character. And, Lord, we would confess to you that even though the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, uh, we deny him. And, Lord, I would confess to you times and even this week of having anger and wrath and malice and abusive speech toward people. So, Lord, I pray you would forgive me as you would forgive all of our brothers and sisters who would confess their sins to you this morning, Father. And Lord, we'd confess the sins of our country. We know that we've run from you. We've done bad things, horrible things, abominable things concerning life and concerning moral choices. And I pray, God, that you'd have mercy upon our nation. Lord, we want to thank you for your provision for this church and for its finances that we were able to hear a report on last week. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for our collective health and for the doctors and nurses among us, our first responders. We ask, God, that you would be watching over and protecting them, helping them to work in the facilities in hospitals to take care of people. Father, thank you, too, for the freedoms that you provide. Um, some are spoken to, Lord, in documents, but you are our freedom, and we thank you that we can come together to meet this morning to praise you, to worship you, to hear a word from your word. And Father, we know we have friends this morning who are in the hospital. Uh, think of Brad and Emily, Lord, and we lift them up to you. We ask that you would protect their lives. You would strengthen them just as you would strengthen those recovering from surgeries, helping people to get back on their feet. And Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for a revival of Christians, that we can be bold, we can represent you, we can agape love people in the world who don't know you yet. So Lord, give us the strength, the boldness this week to do that very thing with the people that we need. And Lord, help us to protect the sanctity of life in our country. We pray these things in Jesus' name this morning. And all of God's people said, Amen. So, a few more things to read from Psalm. These are uh, segments from 103, 66, and 102. <laughs> Thank you. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. And you, O oh Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. Let's all stand again. And we're going to sing God You Reign.
Thank you, everybody. Good morning again. You can be seated. Oh. Hello again. Thank you to our worship team for sharing with us and for all of you for singing and, and just being a part of our, our, our service this morning. Thank you to all who are watching. We're glad to have you with us, too, whether you are at home or you're back in our gymnasium. We're just grateful to have you here, and boy, what a, a great day for us here, uh, especially on Sanctity of Life Sunday. We're thankful for a, a, a relatively new baby that is uh, somewhere in the building, Zach Bonzoff and Nikki. God bless them and their newborn baby. How old now? Would that be a little of me? Okay, all right. We're glad to have them here, and again, we thank God for the children that he's given us as a, as a church family. A uh, great responsibility, a great blessing, great privilege to, uh, to bless those families and, and those children as well. Amen. Well, I'm guessing this morning that, like me, some of you from time to time, you have become doctors. Yeah, that's right. You became a doctor, at least when it came to diagnosing a physical ailment that you were dealing with. You know what I mean? You had an ache, you had a pain, a cough, maybe some stomach problems, a dizziness, numbness, maybe it was breathing issues, a, a fever, a rash, or, or some other symptoms. But instead of making a doctor's appointment, or maybe before you had your appointment, well, you decided to, to first of all take matters into your own hands. You went online. Right? Looking for answers online. You typed in your symptoms, and, and then you went to a number of websites that, that gave you your possible diagnosis. Or maybe you just guessed ahead of time what your diagnosis was, and, and then you went through a list of symptoms for that ailment that you thought you might have. Okay, there are 12 symptoms for that condition, and, and I have three of them. So that's it, right? That must be what I have. Has anybody ever done that besides me? Oh, a bunch of liars out here. Get your hands up there. <laughs> wow. And did you ever notice, if you did that, did you ever notice that what you were convinced you had, it was never a good thing, was it? Not at all. Oh, no. You weren't left thinking, oh, is that all it is? No big deal. I'll be fine. Uh -uh. Oh, no. You, you always managed to find the worst thing possible, which made you hit the panic button. And by the time you saw your doctor, you were able to inform him or her about what you had and the, and the seriousness of your condition. Now, please don't, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that the Internet can't help us when it comes to dealing with sickness and disease and, and various ailments. I'm not saying that. In some cases, it can be helpful to check out a list of symptoms or, or to read up on potential conditions that we could have. I know that many people are doing that right now concerning the COVID symptoms, aren't they? They're online. But I'm also guessing that some of us, okay, some of us have probably heard our doctor say something like this. Why don't we do some tests first before we jump to conclusions? Or maybe they said, why don't you let me be the doctor? Or perhaps you even heard him or her say, you've been on the Internet again, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, you have, and you've got it wrong. You don't have what you think you have, the things that you've been reading about, no. And when it was all over, you realized you didn't know as much as you thought you knew. Oh, sure, you had a few facts right at least about your symptoms, and you had a lot of information and you had personal opinions that made you rather certain about your condition, but what you believed to be true, it wasn't true. And I'm sure that that sort of thing has happened to any number of us here this morning, if we're honest about it. And you know what? It, it happens to all of us, every one of us in other areas of life too, not just about our physical condition. It happens when people come, when it comes to their spiritual condition as well. Now, too often, people try to diagnose their own spiritual condition. They turn to all kinds of sources of, of, of information. 
They develop strong opinions about what they think is true based on their study and their life experiences. They're convinced that they know what their spiritual ailment and their need is. They have it all diagnosed, but they're wrong. They're wrong because they have never had an appointment with God the Holy Spirit. They haven't heard or believed the truth from the one who is the source of all spiritual truth, the one and only God of the Bible. They've never listened to Him. That's why I've been taking some time to, to share a series of messages with you about some of the basic truths that we believe here at the Sydney Evangelical Free Church. Now, I've been speaking about the biblical truths that are found in what we call our church's 12-point doctrinal statement, or we call it our statement of faith. Now, these are some core beliefs from the scriptures that define who we are and, and determine what we do as a church. These are essential truths that every one of us needs to embrace if we want to have a personal relationship with God. And this morning, well, I'm continuing with our fourth statement of faith, which briefly describes our beliefs about God, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were here with us or you were watching online last Sunday, you saw this statement up on our screens right now. Here it is. We believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and during this age to convict men, regenerate the believing sinner, indwell, guide, instruct, and empower the believer for godly living and service. Now, obviously, this statement, it doesn't address everything that we believe from the Bible about the Holy Spirit. There, there's much, much more that we could add to that. But these are the basics, okay? Now, first of all, like, like we heard last week, the primary purpose of God the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit's goal is to point people to Jesus. It's to make Christ the center of our attention. But like we also heard, until Christ returns someday, the Holy Spirit will also convict people about the reality of their sin and guilt before God. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convince people in their hearts that they are sinners and they are separated from God and they need the Savior, Jesus. That means you and I, we don't have to try to make people feel guilty about their sin. The Holy Spirit will do that. But it's also the Holy Spirit who regenerates people spiritually. That means the Spirit gives new life to sinners the moment that they receive Christ as their Savior. Somehow the Spirit creates spiritual rebirth so that people are born again, just like Jesus said. The Holy Spirit restores the life in us that was lost and was dead to sin. He gives us new life. He gives us eternal life. That's why the Apostle Paul could say that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has, has come. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit does in the life of everyone who places their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. But there's more. There's more for us as believers in Jesus, and and I'd like us to look at our statement once again. It says this. It says, We believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and during this age to convict men, regenerate the believing sinner, indwell... And I'll stop right there. That one word, indwell, is very, very, very important. Now... Some of us old people here today who still have our memories, are you good? All right. We might remember from way back in the 1970s, one of the first major movies about demon possession. You're thinking of it already. It was entitled The Exorcist. Maybe you saw it. It was a very disturbing and terrifying movie. And in the 50 years since then, 
We know that there have been many, many more devil or demon movies and books and television shows which have been just as disturbing or even worse. Many of them have even glorified the devil. The same is true, really, for all kinds of pagan religions or godless spiritual movements, the New Age movement, occult teaching, Eastern mysticism, and more for the past 50 years. Many of these false religions and godless movements, they have been avenues for people to ultimately be influenced by or even possessed by demons. As we know, demon possession is nothing new. In fact, in the New Testament, there were numerous times when the Lord Jesus Christ, when He dealt with people who were possessed by demons, He would often set people free from satanic control of their lives. Like I said, that kind of satanic activity, it exists just as much or even more in our day. But here's what I really want you to take hold of this morning, okay? Apart from all of that, it's the fact that you, you are possessed too. You are. That's right. You and I, we are possessed by the Holy Spirit if we've received Christ as our Savior. We are Holy Spirit possessed. That's like our statement says, the Spirit indwells us. The Spirit actually lives inside of us. And how do we know that? In John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, there Jesus, He told His disciples, He said, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Verse 17, the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. Yeah, there it is. We really are possessed. Like Jesus promised, not only is the Holy Spirit with us, he is also in us. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. There the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Paul said, We have received the Spirit. The Spirit indwells us. And get this. The Holy Spirit in us is actually God's proof of ownership of us. It's His guarantee that we really are His people for eternity. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Paul wrote these words, he said, God anointed us, verse 22. He set His seal of ownership on us. He put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Think about that. The Holy Spirit in you is God's down payment, saying that we're going to inherit eternal life. The Holy Spirit living in us also reminds us that we are children of God. It's like the Spirit talks to us so that we always know in our hearts that we are forever God's children. Romans 8, verse number 16 says this, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Yeah. And always, please, always remember when that happened. Very, very important. We receive the Holy Spirit in our lives the moment that we believed in Jesus. We receive the Holy Spirit the moment that we surrendered our lives to Christ once and for all. Again, the Apostle Paul said it, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul wrote these words, and he said, and you also, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. Did you hear that? 
Paul said that we were united with Christ when we heard the true gospel message about salvation and we believed it. At that very moment when we believed, we were given the Holy Spirit who, like we heard before, is God's mark of ownership on us. He is God's guarantee that that we're going to inherit eternal life. Now, all of that means that you don't have to wait to receive the Holy Spirit after you believe in Jesus. It means you don't have to have a second experience of some kind to receive the Holy Spirit, like some Christians teach. You don't have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. Like Paul said in Ephesians, it happens immediately when Jesus saves someone from their sins. At that very moment in time, they are possessed by the Spirit forever in the most wonderful way possible. But reading on this morning, once again up on our screens, our statement says, We believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and during this age to convict men, regenerate the believing sinner, indwell, guide, instruct, and empower the believer for godly living and service. After we receive Christ as our Savior and the Holy Spirit indwells us, Scriptures teach that He can then guide us and instruct us through life. Jesus said it again in John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. He said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. Verse 13, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. Or in John chapter 14, verse number 26, Jesus said, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Now, just for a moment this morning, I want you to think about a guide, okay? A person, someone who is a guide. When you think about that, what comes to your mind? Well, I know for me, it, first of all, it's probably like a hunting guide or a fishing guide <laughs> comes to my mind. Uh, maybe a, a travel guide or, or a tourist guide. I, I've, I've been with folks like that before and more. But, you know, regardless, it's someone who's an expert or someone who excels at what they do. A guide is someone who knows the way and, and wants to show me. It's someone who wants me to learn and succeed. It's somebody who is genuinely concerned about my well-being and my life experience right then and there. That's similar to what a teacher does, isn't it? A good teacher wants to impart knowledge to us. A teacher wants us to learn and understand and grow and succeed in life. A teacher wants to prepare us for the future. A good teacher wants us to know what is true. Well, that's somewhat descriptive of the role of the Holy Spirit as our personal guide and teacher in life. Jesus said that the Spirit would guide His followers into all truth. The Spirit would be our personal tutor for life. And always keep this in mind as well. well. This, This is very important. The Spirit's primary means of guiding and teaching us It is through the truth of God's Word, through the Bible. Oh, yes, the Holy Spirit can use other means to guide us and teach us. I believe that. The Spirit might do it through our life circumstances. The Holy Spirit might guide us or or teach us through the godly counsel of other believers or, or through gifted Christian teachers. It's even possible the Spirit could guide or teach us through, through some kind of supernatural experience. But whatever we're being taught, or however we are being guided, we believe we're being guided by the Holy Spirit, it must line up with the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit will never instruct us or guide us to do anything that is contrary to what the Bible says. Do we understand that? That's why if somebody ever says to you that God told them 
to do something? Has that ever happened? If they ever tell you that, that God told them to do something, which you know violates the clear teaching of the Bible, you can say to them without judging, no, he didn't. Uh-uh. No, he didn't. God did not tell you to do that. That is not from the Lord. He didn't tell you to, to divorce your spouse so that you could run away with your new partner who seduced you. That was not from God. He didn't tell you that you can be happy and healthy and wealthy if you just have enough faith and claim it in Jesus' name, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? No. The Holy Spirit's guidance and His instruction, it will always be in accordance with the clear teaching of God's eternal Word. And let me say this as well. Last week, when, when I happened to, to Google the word guide, to, to look at some word definitions, very interesting how, how many videos about spirit guides immediately popped up. There were all kinds of videos about how people connect, can connect with their personal spirit guides who are trying to give them divine guidance for, for love and happiness and for discovering their own divinity and becoming one with the universe and a bunch of other garbage. Yeah, that's out there. It is everywhere. Please understand. Those so-called spirit guides, they are real. They are but they are not related to the Holy Spirit. They are not God's angels. They are evil spirits. They are fallen angels. They are demonic, and they are ultimately dedicated to people's destruction. That's where they'll take you, as innocent as it might look and sound. Do not go anywhere near that kind of occult influence. Instead, all of us, we need to make sure that we are being taught and led by the Holy Spirit and not by the so-called wisdom of the world, that unbelieving world and rebellion against God. We need to make sure that, that what we believe and what we communicate to others, it really is spiritual truth that we have learned from the Holy Spirit. It needs to be like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 13. Paul wrote, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. That's how the Holy Spirit wants to guide us and instruct us. But Spirit is also committed to this. Once again, on our screens, we see our statement. We believe that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and during this age to convict men, regenerate the believing sinner, indwell, guide, instruct, and empower the believer for godly living and service. The New Testament book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul was, was writing to some Christians who were being taught that in order to be saved, they needed to obey the Old Testament Jewish laws in addition to believing in Jesus. If you're familiar with Galatians at all, you've probably read that. These believers, they were being pressured to add human effort to faith in Christ, which was contrary to the grace of God. So Paul, Paul attacked this false teaching. And, and one of the ways that he did it was by writing these words in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Paul wrote this. He said, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like you to learn just one, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Paul asked those Christians, he said, Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Wow. Now, the obvious answer 
from Paul was that they had received the Holy Spirit by simply believing the gospel. It was, it was by faith alone in Jesus Christ. They understood that just like we do. They weren't saved by observing God's laws. But then Paul, after he had asked that question, he said, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? And the point of this question was to show these believers that it was foolish, foolish to think that, that they should or they could go on in life as Christians by human effort alone. They were missing a major purpose of the Holy Spirit in their lives if they were going to depend on themselves instead of Him. And that brings us back to the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to empower us for godly living and service, like our statement said. The Spirit is our personal, supernatural power source as everyday followers of Christ. And very quickly, here's some of what the Holy Spirit will do so that we can live godly lives. For one thing, the Holy Spirit will empower us to keep us from indulging in sin, the kind of sin that was associated with our old nature before we received the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul went on to write. He said, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Think about that. We can resist our old sin life and its ugly consequences when we submit to the Spirit's leading in our daily lives. Or reading on in Galatians 5, verses 22, 23, Paul added this. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, there are, 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 these are the kinds of of desirable qualities and character traits the Holy Spirit will produce in our lives as we depend on Him. That's the kind of spiritual fruit that we'll see in us. We'll see it growing in our lives as we trust the, look to the Holy Spirit. Or in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18, 19, 20. There the apostle also described that the kind of uplifting fellowship and, and the worship that we can experience with other believers when we give the Spirit control of our lives. Paul wrote, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, don't be under the influence of alcohol, which is a waste of your life. Don't go there. Don't go down that road. Instead, he said this, be continually under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit fill your life and take control of you repeatedly. Do it every day. The Holy Spirit living in us should also motivate us to run away from sexual immorality, which is so prevalent in our world. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18, 19, and 20, we're told this, Flee, run from sexual immorality. He who sins sexually sins against his own body. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Think about that. Your body is a temple. It is a walking, talking temple. Your body is, is not for your spirit as a temple, but, but for the Holy Spirit who actually lives inside of you. That's why sexual immorality is so devastating for Christians. It causes us to defile our personal dwelling place for the Spirit of God. And finally, 1 Thessalonians 
we are warned not to resist the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it simply says this, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Now, all of this reminds us that God the Holy Spirit wants to be at work in our lives as Christians with supernatural power. That means we should never depend on our own human strength. It's the same as Paul told the Galatian Christians. Just like, like we couldn't save ourselves from our sin and we needed the Holy Spirit to give us new life, well, we will always need the Spirit. We'll always need the Spirit to continue working in us for the rest of our lives. We'll always need the Spirit's power so that we can live godly lives. That way, think about it. If somebody ever asks you after you've done something good, okay, if they ever ask you, what possessed you to do that? You can honestly say, the Holy Spirit, right? That's what possessed you to do the right thing. And finally, the Holy Spirit wants to empower believers for godly living and service. Service. New Testament book of Acts, just before Jesus returned to heaven and before the Holy Spirit had been given to His followers, Christ told those, those believers what to expect when the Spirit came. Remember it? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said this. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And once again, right here, we're, we are reminded that the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it isn't just about us. A lot of it is, but not all of it. It's about others, too. It's about God being able to use us to be Jesus' witnesses throughout the world. It's about the Spirit giving us power to boldly proclaim the truth about Christ, which the whole world needs to hear and believe. But that power of the Holy Spirit, it's also given to us so that we can serve and strengthen other Christians in Jesus' church. Now, many of you know from the Bible that God has given every single believer at least one special ability to serve Jesus' church. We call them what? Spiritual gifts, right? And they're listed for us in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse number 4. We read these words. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, to each Christian, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. This is just number, another way of saying Every single Christian, no matter how long you've known Christ as your Savior, every one of us has received at least one spiritual gift, at least one special ability that the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to use to serve Jesus' church. That's why Christians who, who don't want to be a part of a local church or, or some Christians who aren't consistently involved in a church family they aren't being led by the Holy Spirit. They don't want to be a part of His church. They aren't living under the influence of the Spirit. If they have no use for other believers, they aren't using the Spirit's power for godly service like He wants. In fact, they may actually be doing what Paul warned us not to do. Remember, he said, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Some Christians live that kind of life because they don't want to be a part of His church. Instead, we should all remember Paul's prayer, his prayer for Christians just like us. It was his prayer for us to continually be strengthened in our faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul, he said, I pray, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power, through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
Well, that's some of the truth about God's Holy Spirit and His ministry. That's some of what the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in your life and in mine. Fortunately, we know from the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit will regenerate people and He will indwell them when they trust Christ to save them from their sins. That's a done deal the moment that people believe in Jesus. However, much of what else the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and what the Spirit wants to do through us, that depends on us, on our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It depends on our submission to Him. It depends on our following His lead. And we have to continually give the Holy Spirit control of our lives and depend on His power in order for the Lord to continually change us and, and use us. Do you understand that? Some things the Holy Spirit will do no matter what, and other things we have to, as Paul said, be led by the Spirit or keep in step with the Spirit. We have to submit to the Spirit's leading in our lives. I want to challenge you this morning, just like I would challenge myself, to think about that this week. Am I truly submitting my life to the Holy Spirit's leading? Am I being filled again and again with the Spirit taking control so that what I say and what I think and what I do, it's from Him? Am I truly living like a possessed person, a possessed Christian, possessed by the, by the Spirit of God? If not, tomorrow morning, begin your day saying, Lord Jesus, Lord God, I surrender to You. Holy Spirit, please, I want to be filled today. I want you to empower me, use me, guide me, teach me. I want to listen to the Spirit. May God help us to do that. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, thankful for your presence in this place. We're so thankful for the Holy Spirit living in us. We are possessed people because we have your Spirit that you have given. And I pray... Every one of us, the rest of this day and the rest of this week, will live according to the presence and power of your Spirit in our lives. And we do pray these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to be dismissed in prayer, but I wanted to bring to your attention, how many of y'all have noticed Brent's principal voice? You know, he's doing his announcements, and then he starts praying, he gets his principal voice. It gets loud, and it gets booming. But he forgot something this morning. And since he forgot, I went ahead and had the doors locked out front, and we don't have the ARC meals covered yet. So as soon as you all sign up the ARC for the ARC meals, we'll unlock the doors, and you can go to Arby's for lunch, Okay. <laughs> But Brent's such a gentle spirit, he won't ever lock the doors. I'm kind of like that. You know, you got to have the gentle spirit, then you got to have the troublemaker, I guess. Okay? So let's, let's stand, let's pray, and thank God for the, all the grace and glory he gives us. Father, we thank you this morning, as, and as, as Chris led us in the, in the praise team, led us in song. Hallelujah, Father, that you reign. We're so uh, wondering what's going on in this world right now, Father, but we proclaim you as the living ruler of our lives and of our land. We proclaim that the same, the sanctity of life for both unborn and living through you, Father. And we are privileged to live in your grace and mercy and, and the love you shower down on us. As we enter another week of change in our nation, and by that change, actions that will change the whole world, Father, we ask you to, again, show your power and show that you are reigning over this earth. Though we live in the most powerful nation on this earth, Father, we know that is only through your grace and through your power. Father, we uh, ask you to be with the leaders of our nation this week and give us peace on this earth, Father. We, want, we need unity, Father, and let, us, let it be in your name, that unity. 
Be with us as we continue and continue to bless us this coming week. Bless us with wellness. Bless us with grace. And bless us with mercy. Be with those that are be with those of our number and others that are suffering with physical illnesses, and also spiritual illnesses, Father, and, and bless them and, and guide them. Go with us this week. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.